Howdy, and welcome to the Obscure Cinema, the place where I talk about weird, forgotten movies and probably make fun of them. It's talking about stuff that nobody knows about good for this tiny little channel. No. There's no bright side to that. No, fuck that. I want to talk about these movies. That's all I need. I need to make a new playlist because guess where I found these movies? Tubi. No, don't play something else. God. I should use my TV more often. It's it's really boring. Man, I need a new source for content. I just don't know where to find bad movies. Never mind, every streaming surface is gold. The topic of today's video is not one, not two, not three, but six movies. These hyperfixations are not helpful trying to keep a consistent upload schedule. <sighs> Whoops. These movies are a six part adventure that follows a boy in his journey through time. That boy is Josh Kirby, Time Warrior. That name is impossible to sound badass. I don't think a single character named Josh has ever been cool. There's only one cool Josh in the world, who's coincidentally the only Josh, this kid. Holy shit, that was two years ago? Man, oh fuck. And I don't have to explain Kirby, okay? Little circle with the power of God. Brian David Gilbert did that already. The movies follow Josh as he gets wrapped up in saving the universe in a little treasure hunt to stop the forces of evil from destroying all of time. But before we go over the movies, let's go over everything else. These films were made by a subsect of the generic horror and science fiction B-movie studio, Full Moon Features. They're known for the Puppet Masters, Subspecies, Killjoy, and Transfers movies. They also made a movie called Evil Bong. Blaze it? For sure. With a flamethrower, I hope. The sub-studio that worked on these was known as Moonbeam Entertainment. They also made a movie called Dragon World, and I might make a video on that because... Oh God. Dragon! There aren't really any high-named actors in these movies, with the exception being Steve Blum, who is one of the most prolific voice actors of all time. Prolific? Pro Prolific? Prolific. Prolific. I think that's the right word. Barry Ingram is a Broadway performer who also voiced the main character in The Great Mouse Detective. Corbin Alred is Josh himself. Jennifer Burns is Azabeth Siege. And then Derek Webster is the villainous Dr. Zoetrope. Alright, we gotta get into these movies now or else this video is gonna be like an hour long. Um, and I don't really have the mental capacity to deal with that right now. <laughs> The first movie starts out with a prologue that's at the beginning of every single movie. It sucks because it spoils most of the overarching story beats, uh, and even worse, it's the same two minute intro for every goddamn movie. But hey, this is Josh Kirby we're talking about. I don't know where I was going, there's n that changes nothing. Some of the people who worked on these movies had to have used pen names. I mean. Time Winters? Or Vivi Dragon Vasil? Oh, and don't forget the music being composed by Richard Band? Okay, no, start the actual movie. We meet Josh as he wakes up for school. There's this weird scene where he puts a broken watch into a drawer, um, and I kind of get what they're going for, but this specific plot point is never talked about ever again past this opening scene, so... I don't know. Josh sits down for breakfast and we immediately learn that his mother is dead. Yikes, okay, off to a low start. We got broken watches, dead mom, Josh Kirby. <laughs> he says goodbye to his dad and races to school. We get this sick scene of him riding around town in a, oh. Rest in peace. Did the giraffe go down with the company or did they have like, like is there a Twitter account? I don't know. Sorry, anyway. He makes it to school in record time and is stoked about it. Yes! Me when I finally finished watching all these movies. Yes! In school, we meet Josh's friend, Erwin. Yo, Josh man, Kirby man. 
He's a character that I thought would have more importance because he's connected to a plot point that I'll get into in a second, but he just disappears until the last movie, so. Josh goes home and finds a weird, clear thing in his dog's house. Holy he immediately takes it to Erwin, and they try to figure out what it is. During this, a scary man in armor that seems to be following around Josh scares the shit out of his dad. The boys learn nothing, so Josh just heads home. Well, not quite. He comes across a couple of time-traveling geniuses and ultimately tags along for a ride. But not before Dr. Zoetrope gets his metal mitts on Josh's nullifier piece with his telekinesis skills, I guess? You see, the trick is that it's actually... A uh, really cool string. So, I don't want to break the movie magic, but string. New Irwin gives Josh this time stabilizer band thing, and then explains that the nullifier is this artifact that can essentially control the fate of time. In the intro, we see that old Irwin's ancestor, New Irwin 1138, the man that Josh helps find the pieces, originally took all the pieces and spread them out through time. So yeah, he, he scattered them all, and then he just turned around and said, Hmm, now where did I put all those pieces? Anyway, they land in medieval times and immediately get captured along with this warrior girl named Azabeth, who's been taken from her original era. Hey look, dinosaurs. Goodbye, Azabeth. You've been in this movie for all of two minutes. The rest of this movie just sets up this time period's conflicts. You've got this ex-king whose brother took over his kingdom. He wants it back, but with all of his people getting sacrificed to his brother's dinosaur, uh, it's kind of difficult. But with Josh and Erwin each having someone that they want to save, more on this little freak in a bit, they team up and plan to go fuck shit up. With the help of a dinosaur of their own and some insider information, in the first half of movie two, the battle begins. Honestly, uh, this part's really fun, I, I enjoy it quite a bit. The good guys kick ass, the king gets his kingdom back, and the prisoners are saved. Oh, yeah, this little thing is Prism, uh, an alien species known for their color-changing hair. His specific trigger just so happens to be nullifier components. Uh, I don't, I don't like him. Also, he shares a voice actor with Tank Dempsey. K to the I to the A, zombitch! Speaking of nullifier components, they find another one inside of their dinosaur uh, and then head back to their time machine. However, Zoetro blasts Josh's time band, and he's abruptly sent through time, with Erwin and the gang following behind. The second half of this movie is probably my least favorite part of this entire series. Yeah, uh, they become toys for this weird, gross baby thing. It reminds me of something, but I, I just can't put my finger on it. Now, please let me know what this thing reminds you of in the comments. It's driving me crazy. We get to know these stereotypical characters for all of, like, 30 minutes as they figure out how to get out of this really boring-looking bedroom. Not only is this part rushed, not funny, and a little ugly, the set design's just really fucking boring. After successfully tripping up the creature with some sick bike tricks, the gang gets away and with Zoetrope in tow. Don't worry, he gets away. Movie 3. Josh gets sucked out of the time machine and falls into a new time, and oh god, no, they're toys. Okay, she's fine. Her design isn't all that creepy, and oh fuck. This movie is... unsettling. Annie and Theo here are inhabitants of Toy World. Can you guess who else lives in Toy World? Yeah, it's toys. And a man named Geppetto. Father. But first, we've got to watch this entire scene from the prologue again. It's just copy and pasted from the first movie. Gotta run it all the way through. Josh gets another piece of the nullifier and then heads into Toy World to talk to Geppetto. I, I do want to talk about one thing when it comes to this movie. Uh, it's about Annie. She is down bad for Josh. Like, the entire time. In Toy World, we spend five whole minutes on a song and dance scene which came completely out of left field on top of that oh it's so creepy zoetrope shows up and threatens josh i don't know i, I kind of zoned out at this point because all i could think about was geppetto he is always smiling it's like someone's got a hitman lined up on one of these buildings just waiting for him to break. The main crew gets away, and Zoetrope uses fear to make the toys do his bidding. 
This is where this movie takes a really dark turn. The places that Josh keeps ending up aren't like alternate dimensions or planets yet. It's the past and future. And the lore behind this point in time is fucking crazy. Before Geppetto created Toy World, he made robots for war. Those robots were so good at killing, they killed everyone. And then killed each other. So as one of the last few survivors on this part of the planet, he built a bunch of semi-sentient toys with no interest in violence as a way to make up for the fact that he contributed to the mass destruction of the human race. Do you know what I felt when my mechanical army had conquered a land and I was the only non-toy left? Victorious? Triumphant? Because I had fought the good fight? I felt lonely, incredibly, horribly lonely. And then this fucking thing shows up. Scrumptious. Here, Josh learns through a hologram of Zoetrope that he's a time warrior, a one in a billion person who's able to somewhat control time. Knowing how powerful he can become, the evil genius asks for an alliance, but of course Josh turns him down. With his gained knowledge, he heads back to Toyland in an attempt to contact his friends who are about to stop searching for him. Zoetrope shows up and... No, no, not the music again. Yes! Movie four, please. We are going full sci-fi for this one. The time pod gets overrun by these little worms that eat the ship, sending them to a random point in time. It just so happens to be the time that Azabeth is from which is also on a different planet. Thought this would just be about time travel, but I guess we're doing space stuff now. This entire movie is incredibly safe. Azabeth's people are at war with another society, and bringing these destructive worms into their last bastion of hope made them enemies. So half the movie is just Josh and Irwin in a prison cell. And don't even get me started on Zoetrope. I'm summing this one up, it, it's boring. The commander of the good guys, who's also Azabeth's fiance, how old are these people supposed to be, oh my god. He's struggling to keep the enemies at bay, and with the added worm infestation, he's given up hope. The whole time, Azabeth is trying to get the boys out of prison, but it doesn't work. They end up escaping and finding out that the worms are attracted to the nullifier pieces. Josh comes up with a plan, but the commander doesn't want to hear it. So, Azabeth challenges him to an Agni Kai, and she wins. They use Josh's plan to send the worms into the enemy's main ship, but not without an intense moment where Josh gets stuck. Just take the goddamn shoe off, man. The bad guy shows up, Josh babyfies him, and this character who's had like three lines of dialogue messes everything up by reassembling the nullifier without all the pieces. Two more. We're almost there. The last new place they show up is this weird mushroom kingdom, with some Pretty decent costume design. Azabeth takes a bite out of one of them and falls ill. Never mind that. The mushroom people believe that Prism is their god. And they call him... A furry one. I don't have any comment on that, but it got me thinking. Imagine you die. You go into the afterlife and walk through whatever version of the pearly gates there is. Uh, and a godly figure who greets you is just a furry... You Furry. The king tells them that they need a sample of the spores from a shroom named Puffball. But he's dead. He got eaten by a monster known as the Muncher. He forbids them from going searching for him, but a couple of mushroom folks sneak them out. They run into a mushroom kid named Ding Dong who's looking for his father, Puffball. So they work together to find the monster, but not before getting scared by some glowing ovals. <laughs> I don't know why that clip is so fucking funny to me. They find the muncher, and with some incredible green screen to boot. It eats up the mushroom people and Azabeth, but Josh figures out that it's nothing more than some weirdo's robot. Colonel Damon here is the leader of an intergalactic circus who just so happens to have a robot that munches people for no nefarious reason at all. He takes them to where all the other mushroom people are staying, and there he is. The man of the hour. Puffball! Uh, unfortunately, they're too late, and Azabeth fucking dies. Puff Puffball's right here. No. Puffball. <laughs> so, uh, Josh controls time. It's kind of funny, though, because he, he just keeps saying five minutes. 
Josh, how much longer are you gonna be in there, man? Fine, kitchen sink it is. He does turn back time and saves her. Erwin's kind of pissed about that though. Uh, it's kind of weird. Speaking of weird, Damon mind controlled all the people into acting in his circus. He's, he's f f fucking creep. The, the writers really gave up at the end here with this standoff. The main characters can't do anything to the colonel because only he can stop the mind control effect, but he ends up hitting himself with the blaster and then through some random bullshit, Prism knocks them all out of it. Also, Zoetrope is just there. They leave him with the now ethical circus and head to bed out on a cliffside. But something drives Josh away from the group. That is, of course, the final nullifier component. Oh no, glowing ovals. Josh falls off the cliff and what do you know, the only person around to help is Zoetrope. He, of course, wants the piece in Josh's hand, so he only agrees to pull him up if he hands it over which he does. Zoetrope then drops a bombshell of an accusation by asking Josh to probe his mind to see that Irwin's been manipulating him the whole time. Before he can do it though, Irwin comes in with an epic quick scope and takes out Zoetrope. And yeah, he turns out to be the bad guy. You know what? Honestly, it's a better twist villain than most of the Disney and Pixar ones, so. The final movie, yes. This one gets kind of fucking crazy. After Irwin gets away in Zoetrope's time armor, Josh probes the slightly less evil doctor's mind. He learns that Zoetrope initially put together the pieces of the nullifier to destroy its evil counterpart known as the Decimator, which is the sole reason that keeps the tyrannical overlords called the Supreme Prefect in power. So, once again, we're shown that same scene from the first movie that they also showed in the third movie. They hatch a plan to stop Erwin from retracing his way through time by intercepting him back when they first stepped into Josh's time. And to get there, they're gonna use Josh Kirby himself. No, the name still doesn't sound cool. They make their way through the time stream, but offshoot the destination by about 14 years. Also, they're invisible through time matter manipulation or... I don't... My head fucking hurts, man, I don't know. So they've got to think of another way out of this time. But while Zoetrope does that, Josh hears something coming from his house. And when he goes inside, he sees his mom alive. Holy shit, how did I not see that coming? It's a time travel movie, of course he's gonna see his dead mom. Why wouldn't that happen? He also meets himself as a baby and ends up causing his dad to be like super protective of him which he shows in the first movie. Zoetrope finishes his makeshift time travel device, uh, but it doesn't work, it shrinks them instead. Josh has a weird little heart to heart with his sleeping mom, and then they try to use Josh's power after he fully recharges. Uh, it doesn't work though, because I guess baby Josh has all of the time powers right now. It it's okay though, Zoetrope has a backup plan. A backup plan that involves sending him, Azabeth, and Prism to time limbo. Forever. Pour one out for the lads, they're fucking dead now. Josh stops Irwin, collects the now invisible nullifier components, and helps the past version of Dr. Zoetrope put an end to the horrible decimator once and for all. And after all that, Josh wakes up. God damn it. It was all a dream, a horrible, horrible dream. That is until an alternate version of Azabeth shows up to his school. And with this eerie shot of a clock, it's all over. No more Josh Kirby. Yeah! All right, final thoughts and we can all go about our days. First off, this series is, is, is pretty all right. I don't really know why I still rate everything I talk about, but here are all the movies individually rated on the on my rating system. It's not based on anything too critical, it's just mostly how much I enjoyed it. As for the series as a whole, um, it's a bit more up in the air for me. I shit on these movies a lot, but that doesn't mean I didn't actually enjoy watching them. They're easy to make fun of just because of how low budget and messy they are. I mean, hell, look at this really long shot of one of the boom mics just chilling in the frame. This series is like if Doctor Who and Back to the Future had a six-part Disney Channel original movie baby. But hey, they tried a bunch of different techniques in order to make this movie series possible. CGI, puppetry, makeup and costume design, claymation, horrible green screen. They had giant set pieces, a fully practical time armor suit, and whatever the fuck this is, I hate it. Please go away. <laughs> I don't know. 
I, I guess I'll give it a five plus. If you've seen these movies, let me know. I'm just hoping this video will unlock the memories of this series that were just buried away. Anyway, adios.